Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this pan planet, people of Earth, and welcome to our City Live. Uh, so today we have a very special live, uh, City Live with a lot of guests. Uh, we are going to talk about asteroid, specifically a Trojan asteroid and the space mission led by NASA. So for this uh, City Live, we invited a very a great team of guests and let me introduce them. So first of all, we have uh, Kathy Olkin. Hi, Kathy. You're mute, but it's good. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Uh, Kathy is a deputy principal investigator for the NASA Lucy mission, which is the main topic of this conversation. And together with uh, Kathy, we have uh, Tim Russ. Hey, hi, Tim. How are you? How are you? Good. So Tim is a musician, actor. You know Tim Russ. If you follow a bit of, if you watch TV, if you have a TV on this planet, you probably know who is Tim Russ. So uh, um, we are going to talk about more about that later on. And uh, with us again, amazing. This is the second time we have Rachel Knight. Hi, Rachel. Hey. So Rachel is a citizen astronomer for the Unistellar Network, and she's going to tell us how she contributed to this uh, campaign of observations. So uh, before talking about the campaign, let's set the stage, Kathy, and please tell us uh, what is the Lucy mission uh, that we are going to talk a lot about in the next 10 years. Yeah, happy to tell uh, you about the Lucy mission. So it's a NASA mission that's gonna be the first mission to explore the Trojan asteroids. These are asteroids that share an orbit with Jupiter. There's two swarms of these asteroids, one ahead of Jupiter in its orbit and another behind Jupiter in its orbit. And we are gonna be sending uh, the Lucy spacecraft uh, on a journey to visit seven Trojan asteroids over the course of 12 years. We're gonna to go to the swarm that's in front of Jupiter and behind Jupiter in this exploration. It's gonna be very exciting. We wanna understand these primitive objects and we've never seen one of these uh, up close before. So it's really gonna transform our understanding of uh, our solar system, solar system evolution and small body populations. Hi, you have a movie. Do you want to show the movie or you want to first to talk about the state view of the spacecraft? Yeah, so I have a still image of uh, the spacecraft. So maybe we can start with that. I will show that. And yeah. there's an artist rendition of what the spacecraft looks like. And there it is. Um, so uh, you can see it has these large solar arrays on it. That's how we get our power powered by the sun and we get to produce the uh, energy needed to uh, control the spacecraft, the computers on board and our instruments. And this is an artist rendition of what the a Trojan asteroid will look, may, might look like. And we are, I'm excited to have the instruments on board that will be able to tell us what it really looks like. So we don't have to rely on this beautiful artist rendition. And then um, Frank, if you could pull up the uh, other still image, I wanna give people a sense of the scale of the spacecraft. Okay, so this is a picture of me, that's me there next to the spacecraft and the antennas on the top of the image. And on the bottom is a, our instrument pointing platform. And this is a, a platform that's on a two axis gimbal so it can rotate in two directions and it has our instruments on it. And this is how we're gonna point basically the eyes of our spacecraft at the Trojan asteroids as we fly by each one of these asteroids so we can learn about them. So um, that's you here, right? That's right. That's me. Is what you wear every day spacecraft. when you go to work? That is what I wear when I go to work, especially if I get to go in the clean room. Often I sit in meetings as well, and then it just looks kind of like what you see here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's always great to go and see the spacecraft and talk to the engineers and technicians who are just super busy building and testing the spacecraft. I've got a little video that can show... Um, testing the spacecraft, this is it. So if we can go ahead and play that. This is how we're testing the spacecraft. It's really important that you test like you fly and fly you like you test. And so we've done a bunch of tests already on the spacecraft uh, so that we can make sure it's gonna work on its four billion mile mission. mission. So that, those are our solar arrays 
and that's going to make sure that we have power on the spacecraft. We've done uh, simulations in a thermal vac chamber with the spacecraft, the arrays already separately. And this is the thermal vac chamber. The little structure at the top is uh, support uh, to make sure that we're offloading for gravity. That's our instrument pointing platform that I just told you about. It has uh, four different instruments on board so we can get many different views of the Trojan asteroids. And we've done a vibration test where you shake the whole spacecraft to make sure that it's gonna survive launch. And right now we are currently in thermal vacuum testing. So the whole spacecraft is in that chamber you saw before and we've pumped the air out and now we're changing the temperature and operating the spacecraft to make sure that it's gonna do what it needs to do in flight in space. So it's getting, it's really exciting. And we are going to launch in October of this year. So uh, please follow along and I'm sure you're gonna hear about our launch uh, this fall. So it's very exciting. So you're going to the, to the launch? Oh yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not only am I going to the launch, that big uh, aircraft they showed when we take the spacecraft down to Florida, I plan on being on that as well, right next to, the Lucy spacecraft to make sure everything goes. You're gonna just be right. in the in the airplane that carry the space. I'm gonna be in the airplane that carries. Make sure the that space. nothing happened. That's right. I don't know what I would do, but you know, I'm gonna be there. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you, Kathy, for this introduction on this remarkable mission, which is, I will say, it's um, the Trojan asteroid has kind of this interesting population that's composed of different type of asteroids. So studying them will give us some idea of the past of Earth, uh, the past of our solar system, because the, like, uh, the, the, the swarm here contain multiple population, which may have been captured during the motion of the asteroids or the motion of the planet. And that's, that's one of the reasons we love this Trojan population. And that's, and that's exactly right. There's different spectral types. So it tells you about the, the composition on the surface. There's different color populations. And we chose our targets really carefully so that we're sampling the diversity. We're looking at different diverse topics, uh, Trojan asteroids, so that we can understand what makes them different. And there's one theory that they're different because they formed at different heliocentric distances, different mm -hmm. distances from the sun and um, they would have been composed of different things and that they might have been captured during a chaotic evolution early in the formation of the solar system. So that's why we're going to go visit all these different types of Trojan asteroids. Excellent. So let's go back to Earth here. Um, uh, on May 9 at 1.30 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, uh, one of these, one of these target, uh, the one of these target, the Patroclus system, made of two components, Patroclus and Minotius, which are 95 kilometer, 98 kilometer asteroids orbiting around the center of mass, um, was ba basically passing between us and a bright star. And in this case, what we see on Earth is the star disappearing for a few seconds because of the motion of the asteroid. It's like we're seeing the shadow casting on the surface of our, of our planet. And this is called occultation. And we have been using that for years to study asteroids, to study uh, Menbel asteroids, but also Trojan asteroids. So this prediction was made by Mark Bui from Swiri, a colleague of yours, right? That's correct. And, um, and as you know, we have at the SETI Institute, we work with the Unistellar Network. So this is the tiny telescope that called the EV scope, which is capable of doing this kind of observations. So the shadow was passing of Patroclus specifically was passing above California all the way to Wisconsin. And this is the this is basically the shadow predicted by Mark, Mark uh, during um, a few days before the event. Uh, the, the blue line here is the center of the occultation prediction predicted. And uh, the green line here is like the maximum it's basically the size of the shadow, just to simplify this. So we ask people uh, who have a, who has an, an EV scopes and also others, IOTA has been involved in this project as well, and Mark has access to his own telescope uh, called the Recon Project. 
to observe this event together simultaneously. And um, Tim and Rachel, uh, who are somewhere here in, in, uh, in Los Angeles area, observe this event. So um, what do, what, what, what is it? I, I should say that this is important because when you observe an occultation like that, you estimate accurately the, the position of the asteroid, the size of the asteroid, and if you have multiple observers, you can basically also draw the shadow of the asteroid. So have an idea of the shape, the projecting shape of the asteroid on the surface of our planet. And I think that's very important for you, right? For the Lucy mission and for you. For... Can you explain to us why occultation are interesting for, for occultation? Yeah, I, it's so exciting that citizen scientists can participate in uh, providing information for the mission. Like you said, you get astrometric information, so where that target is and how big it is and its shape. And for Patroclus and Menetius, um, the and all the targets, it's really important to get the shape because one of our scientific goals is to understand the density of the Trojan asteroids. The bulk density gives you kind of a, a, a good idea of what they're composed of in general. And um, in order to get the density, you need the mass and you need the volume. And by having these occultation observations, you're getting an estimate of the shape of the object in a two-dimensional two cut across the body. And so that's really gonna help us improve our understanding of the volume of these objects. Um, as I mentioned before, we're, the spacecraft is just flying by these Trojans. We don't have enough fuel to stop and go into orbit around them. So as we fly by, we're gonna be taking a lot of data images so that we can understand the shape of the objects, but they also rotate. And Menetius and Patroclus rotate um, with a period of about a uh, little more than four days. And so four days out, we'd be pretty far away. So having this additional information from the occultations will really help constrain our volume estimates, which helps improve our understanding of the density of these objects. Thank you. So Tim or Rachel, let's start, let's start with you, Tim. How this um, came out? This, uh, what did you do concretely? Did you fly to space to do this observation or what did you, wait, tell us the story here. Yeah, well, I, uh, I was very much earthbound on this particular mission and um, um, I took my telescope out. It wasn't just a couple of blocks away from where I live because I needed a clear uh, a bit, a view of the, uh, of, this, of the southern sky. So um, I took it out and, and set it up uh, near a park um, and, and, and took the link, of course, that was available to, uh, to set up the, uh, the parameters for viewing. And it was very simple. I got to tell you, it was, it was a, it, one of the easiest things I've had to do in a while. I mean, it's almost easier than just regular, you know, target observing for the telescope. It was very, very simple. Um, I was very surprised and very pleased with, and happy with the fact that I could get this done, you know, without, you know, jumping through a, a dozen hoops and, and, and messing it up. So, um, in fact, we, I set it up and, uh, and waited for the moment to happen uh, exactly on the timing. And sure enough, I uh, clicked, it, clicked it and four minutes later it was over with. And then I was just sitting at home waiting for the, for the video to come in to see what it looked like. And it was, uh, I was very excited to see that as well. So overall, as, as far as a, a technical mission, yeah. You know, I, I didn't have to drive to the, uh, the mountains and freeze my butt off for three and a half hours trying to get something. So. It was great to be able to do it this way and and uh, and that quickly. So, what about you, Rachel? What what uh, what's the story? Where were you? Yeah, I did it directly from my backyard. I just kind of walked out at one thirty four in the morning and waited for four minutes while it it kind of dipped out of view. And so, I was able to see kind of on the app that comes with the telescope what I thought was a star disappearing. You never know officially until you kind of see the data later and someone who's a lot smarter than me can tell me if I actually caught it or not, uh, but managed to kind of see some the, the star dip out and it lasted a little bit. So I thought I might've caught it. Um, and then I found out a few days later uh, that yes, I was one of the observers and it, it came out pretty clean, I think this one. Yeah, I should, I should mention that uh, multiple people observe it. Irene, Kevin, who is a teacher um, in uh, high school in, the, in Los Angeles, um, and Victor as well, Osaka, 
who uh, who's, I also have an, an EV scope. What is very interesting is that I observe it, but I, I knew I would not see it because I was in San Francisco, but I just, I wanted to stay awake with you and observe it. And I don't know, maybe there will be a moon or something. Let's try. But um, what's very interesting for this one is everybody who observed it detected it. <laughs> it's kind of unbelievable. <laughs> it's been like the prediction was on target. There is no, uh, so basically, uh, you get lucky and you observe an disappearance that lasted around five seconds, which is almost the maximum we were predicting. Yeah. Um, that's, there is still, we are still, I know Mark is still analyzing the data, Kathy, but maybe you may mention, do you, do you know how many observers been observing successfully this event? Um, I had, there were a lot of people who successfully observed the event. I happened to be in West Texas observing the Manetius occultation of the same star at the same time. And, and so uh, because Patroclus and Manetius are a binary pair and they both uh, went passed in front of this star, the shadow paths went in slightly different locations. And so people got both Patroclus and Manetius and quite a number of observers were successful. And so that's really gonna help us understand that any sort of high frequency change in the limb on Patroclus and Manetius. And that's, that's gonna be really informative for uh, understanding the Trojan asteroids in general. One thing that's really important about Patroclus and Manetius, like because they're a binary pair, they were probably captured in the location that they're in now as a binary. Mm -hmm. um, and that would lead us to believe that they're very primitive objects. And so uh, they're very primitive. And so we're really looking at the fossils from solar system formation with these objects. And it's so exciting that we all get to be here on earth and learning more about these objects in this unique way. So I have a ton of questions, but before that, let me just say hello to our viewers. We have people joining us from Germany, United Kingdom, Czech Republic, Dobriden. Uh, California, France, bonjour, Ohio, Saudi Arabia, Canada, uh, Virginia, Christchurch in New Zealand, Glasgow, UK, Belgium, Porto Alegre, Brazil, and Australia. So we have people from everywhere in the world, almost all, uh, every continent. So welcome. And today we are talking about an observation of an occultation of, by Patroclus, uh, target of the Lucy mission. And we have two citizen astronomers who, um, who observed su successfully this event. So um, uh, Rachel and, and T, maybe what's the motivation for you to do something like that? I'm always wonder what, I mean, you mentioned Tim that uh, you didn't have to freeze you, but for two hours waiting, okay? <laughs> but it was still late, right? It was 1.30 a.m. Yeah. Uh, that, that's not yeah that's not a problem i mean I'm, i i tend to be an owl anyway i'm up always i'm always up late um so that's not an issue um yeah i mean it didn't it didn't require like you know having to drive you know way out of the city and do this and the other thing and one thing i like about the scope is the fact that i can use it right in the city of los angeles and there ain't any more light available anywhere at nighttime than here in the city of los angeles so you, you know this to this scope can cut through that and get things done which is great um saves me a lot of time and energy not having to go to dark skies. It's an hour, an hour and a half away from here. So, mm -hmm. um, so it's great uh, to be able to do that. And, and, I'm, and I've, I've, you know, I guess I've, I've been an amateur astronomer for you know, over 35 years. So um, it's, 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 it's fascinating to me to be able to, to work with um, an instrument like this one, which, you know, quite frankly, I was kind of waiting for, you know, in the evolution of these telescopes. Um, I didn't own a, digit, a, a computerized scope before this. Um, for like an optical telescope. Uh, all of my uh, optical telescopes were all manual. Um, and I've got tracking drives on them, but they're basically manual. So I knew, you know, I, I know and memorized the night sky years ago. So if I wanted to look for an object, I just use a chart and find it. Um, so this scope is really, for me, revolutionary in terms of just how easy it is to use. And, and, I, and I've always been fascinated by astronomy. It's one of my, one of my top favorite uh, subjects in sciences. And and uh, to be able to participate firsthand in something like this is remarkable uh, for me. Uh, it's not just looking at objects that I've not had a chance to really see well with the optical scopes, but to be able to see something that's, that actually can be used by an institution like SETI and, and uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, 
the organizations that are putting together these missions. Uh, this is amazing. Uh, and, and, and I'm thrilled to, to have a chance to do that. Thank you, Tim. What about you, Rachel? Yeah, I guess I'm on the exact opposite end of the spectrum there. Um, I actually picked up astronomy kind of during uh, COVID quarantine. It became a really good uh, isolated hobby. <laughs> so uh, the, I got the scope a little bit before, but really having these goals, I guess, during this time and kind of that online community where we're all frankly, hey, can you catch this now? Can I catch it in a few hours so we can kind of compile the data together? It's really that, been that community that I, I've really appreciated during this time. And I'm always a fan of, of good data collection and being able to contribute to, to science kind of wherever you are. All right. So a reminder of you viewers that can ask questions to Kathy, Tim, and Rachel. In the meantime, I'm just going to take a few seconds to show uh, people what, what you can see, in fact, when you observe an occultation. It's not exciting because what you see is a tiny dot here, a star. That's the star. And this is, uh, I think this is your observation, uh, Tim. And if you look carefully, boom, the star will disappear and disappear for like five or six seconds and then reappear. I don't know. Did you, did you I see? Go ahead. Frank, that's funny because to me, that's so exciting. I mean, I know you say it's not exciting, but to me, it's like, oh my goodness, that the star disappeared. That means that in between us and the star, something passed in front of it, right? And and to know, and I've, I've been on a number of these occultations where the predictions, you know, years ago, they weren't always as good. And so sometimes you wouldn't be successful. So it's so funny that you say that because to me, I'm like, oh my goodness, look at that. It worked, you know. <laughs> I'm just playing the role of blasé, but every time <laughs> I see an occultation, I'm overexcited. But, you know, most people expect to see, I don't know, something colorful and tick-tocking or something like that. It's just a dot disappearing. But yeah. it's true that there is a lot behind this tiny dot disappearing. There is a calculation of the prediction, the position of the star, the modeling of the binary system here, which is, I know because I've done the, I published the first or orbit of this system and it was already complicated. So I know Mark has to work on that. It's been very uh, tough to get, understand really truly the, the perturbation you can get as well. But yeah, seeing a star disappearing like this, it's, I calculated that the shadow is moving at seven, 17 kilometers per second. So that's 10 times the speed of a bullet. To just yeah. give you an idea of the speed here we are, we are seeing. So you saw something passing above your head at this speed with yeah. your EV scope. Yeah. And most of that velocity is, is the fact that the Earth is moving through space. Yeah, exactly. And then, um, so this is something we send to uh, people when they observe with the EV scope. They receive this kind of report, uh, detection result, where we basically list, uh, show them the curve. So this is the light curve. So it's the flux of the star that I show in the, in the circle compared to the flux of another star. And you can see a, a significant drop here because the star disappears. And what inter is interesting to us, to the scientists, is the timing of the, the disappearance and the reappearance. Because then we combine all this timing together from different positions, different observers, and we draw those codes, we call them, and that give us the shape of the, of the system. We are not yet there. We have finished the analysis for most of them. So uh, this is Rachel's report. We have a duration of 5.4 seconds in your case. Uh, we're still working and uh, refining this, but uh, I'm sending the data to Mark in a few days. So he will probably put them together with the 40 -ish other observers who have seen this, uh, this, this occultation. Okay, um, let me see if we have any questions. So, um, yes. So why, why this binary system is particularly interesting? This is a question for Kathy. Why, why did you choose this target for the Lucy mission? So actually, at first, it wasn't a target for Lucy when we very first started the proposal. And then we were looking at where the spacecraft would go over time, and we realized it would go near Patroclus and Manetius. And we're like, we have to go past that object, that pair of objects. 
And, and it really comes back to the fact it's a binary pair. There's not a lot of uh, binary pairs or like a primary and a satellite in the Trojan system. But binary pairs are really common in the outer solar system. And you might remember that I said maybe these objects were captured from the outer solar system. And so part of the reason we want to go specifically to see Patroclus and Menetius is because we think that they're very primitive and that they may have been captured from the outer solar system. And also they're among the largest of the Trojan asteroids. We're, we're looking at Trojan asteroids of different sizes. So uh, Patroclus and Menetius are almost 100, or about 100 kilometers in diameter. Some of our smaller targets are like Kalimali are closer in the 20s, uh, 20s of 25 kilometers-ish. We recently discovered a very small moon around one of our targets and that's about a kilometer in size. So we have this great size range that we're gonna be looking at as well. So that's another reason why Patroclus and Menetius were interesting. Okay. Uh, feel free to ask each other questions, by the way. Huh? I don't, uh, don't expect me to be the, the center <laughs> of this conversation. Uh, we have another question um, for Tim and Rachel. Let me check it out. Uh, what advice or in inspiration do you have for space lovers who are considering getting involved in citizen astronomy? Um, well, from, uh, from my perspective, it, it, you know, if it's citizen astronomy or something like what we are doing, um, this, uh, this would involve the, the type of telescope that we're using, which is um, the unistellar EV scope and, 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 it has, and its capabilities allow you to do a, a, any number of things, everything from tracking asteroids to comets to the occultations and to the, the observing of the objects in deep sky so that these, these events, when they occur, this telescope allows you to do that. So the first thing you'd have to do is, is get a hold of a, a telescope like this one, or particularly this one, um, in order to, to participate in all, all these events uh, along with others uh, out there. Otherwise, you, you would have to get a, 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 another telescope that's more of an optical telescope. Um, and then you would only be able to do um, visual observations of these things um, which would not be as, as easy or practical without, without te technology. So you need a, the, the equipment and the gear first to, to start to participate in something like this. Yeah, I mean, there, there seems to be a lot of kind of entry points to, to getting involved with citizen science, right? There's observations that you can do kind of with your naked eye and just kind of keep recording things. Um, there's various projects out there that you can get involved in, even if you don't have kind of the, ex the, the money or the, the want to necessarily get involved. But having something that's super easy and frankly, very dummy proof, very easy to use is um, basically how I got into it. I, I, building a telescope, figuring out how to do all the calculations, that's always seemed incredibly intimidating to me. Um, there's a lot of very smart people out there that are very good at it, but it, it doesn't seem the most um, novice friendly. So uh, if you're kind of really considering it, I can look, start looking into some easy to use telescopes that would um, make your journey really easy. Yeah, yeah, I would say it's a, uh, my preference is a rock with a light switch. <laughs> what about you, Kathy? Do you have a telescope? <laughs> um, so I don't personally have a telescope, but uh, for work, I have access to a lot of telescopes. And so uh, one of the things I think is just amazing is to take a telescope and go look at the night sky. We're so inundated by uh, bright lights today. And a lot of times people don't just take the time to look up at the sky and it's absolutely beautiful. And through, and using a telescope, you know, you can see things, details that you couldn't see before. And so one of my favorite things to show to people with a telescope uh, is Saturn. Right, and so it's just exciting to see the rings and or seeing Jupiter's moons, um, um, and then taking it to the next level to me is doing things like this occultation science. And occultations are near and dear to me because that's what my uh, PhD thesis was on was stellar occultations, and uh, 
And so I know the science that can be done because it's not only uh, the sizes and shapes and astrometry of, of small bodies like asteroids, but uh, the atmospheric pressure and temperature profiles on bodies that have thin atmospheres or even thick atmospheres. And so there's, there's so much science out there, but it all starts with wondering and just looking at our place in the universe. Yeah, agreed. I'm mute. What? I was mute. Sorry. Just to say, mention. Wait. Uh, you, uh, you. You. What telescope do you use for your PhD on sun occultation? Did you use the airplane one? I did. Oh. I did. I used the Cape Kuiper Airborne Observatory, and um, other telescopes as well. But that was a real highlight. And so I got to fly on the. The airplane, it has a hole in it with this telescope that looks out the side. And that was really important for occultation observations because you had to get into the shadow path. And much of Earth, Earth thankfully, is covered with water, but that makes it hard to put a telescope there. So uh, we flew out over the Atlantic Ocean and observed an occultation by Triton, a moon of Neptune. And, and so, there's so many ways to do this science uh, and big telescopes, small telescopes, it depends on how bright the star is that's being occulted, um, but it's very accessible. Cool, thank you. Yeah, just that's that's true that occultation are kind of an interesting field because there is also all these people working in the background to prepare it. And yeah. then there is this excitement of doing it uh, I did one uh, in uh, Colorado recently, not too far away from you, Kathy, mm -hmm. with a, a group of people, and uh, that was for Apophis. Oh yes, right. That was a big, a yeah, big adventure. We had an entire adventure. We yeah, met in, and... in a place I didn't know anything about. They guide me. Then the cops came. <laughs> I had, we had everything, <laughs> but yeah. we got it. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, that's one thing that I really like about occultations, and I, I think Rachel. Uh, spoke to it, is that it doesn't happen in a vacuum. If just one person gets an occultation cord, that's helpful. But when you have a whole team of people going after an occultation, you, it, you get so much richer scientific data. And so it tends to be a real teamwork and collaborative uh, observation. And I just, uh, that, I like that. That's, that's the kind of thing I like doing. Yeah, that's the reason we chose occultation as the primary uh, goal of the Unistellar network. In fact, that was the because of the community you create around the around the project. Yeah. So we have question. Uh, one question here. Yeah, someone asked. So do we have the shape and uh, uh, the shapes and the size of Patroclus and Minotius from this occultation? Kathy, do you know if we have a first model or? We have a first cut, um, but it's not quite ready to, to share yet. Um, a number of people's data have been reduced, but not everyone's has been included in that. So we have a, a, a decent idea uh, from the event. We know that it was really well observed um, and the details are still forthcoming. And I mean, you know, you also have to think about it. You know, the occultation was just on May 9th and, you know, it takes a little while to analyze the data and, and really get that timing right for, uh, you know, you see the dip in the light curve and you really wanna know where the half light part of the uh, drop is. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's details that you really wanna make sure that you're analyzing the data right, getting the timing right. All of these things are critically important. Yeah, we are, we are still working on, on it, for instance, in our case. We are one of the few who are probably late, but uh, it's gonna come. In fact, this morning we got uh, a new measurement from, from, from Team Data. So you are going to get updates pretty soon. Excellent. Oh, oh Excellent. great, great. So we well, also, go ahead, you know, Team. Well, I was going to say that, you know, to back up what Kathy was saying earlier about the, you know, the people who are asking about getting involved in, um, in citizen astronomy, there's also, like she said, you can get involved, you can get involved in amateur astronomy for, for relatively little money. Um, just buying a small optical telescope, and you could, you could. What what I, what I the reason that I one of the other reasons I liked astronomy is because there are moments and times when certain events will happen. We get a, a close flyby of a comet that you can observe, the naked eye, and and really wonderfully through a telescope of almost any size. Um, and there's also special events like the, for example, the the uh, Shoemaker Levy Nine 
a collision with uh, Jupiter, that asteroid. I was able to observe that with, again, a relatively small telescope um, as it was happening. The, we were able to see the marks that were left on the surface of Jupiter. That was one of the most exciting things I've done with just a simple optical telescope. And, and you, these kinds of things will happen again at some point in time. We'll get these really extraordinary astronomical events that you can watch, whether it's an eclipse, a lunar or solar, whether it's a collision with an, astro an, uh, an asteroid collision or whether it's a comet that close fly, uh, fly by that we can see. Um, those are the kind of things you can get with a relatively small telescope, just an optical telescope, a three or four or five inch aperture, a Dobsonian or a Maksudov or something like that, a Cassegrain. You can get these very, uh, and, and it can be computerized or it can be manual. Just, just uh, you know, basic stuff that you can get into it with uh, that don't that doesn't cost a lot of money. So, she she's absolutely right. And and for that kind of ob ob observing, uh, a lot of people can participate in that without having to spend a lot of bread. Okay, well we are almost yeah we passed the half hour. So I uh, just before finishing a few things. So. If you want to participate in occultation and you're watching us here and you want to be specifically involved in uh, occultation with the Spirit mission or with the Lucy mission, sorry, there is a website for that called uh, lucy.swiri.edu. Will, we will post the link where we have the list of all occultation predicted by, by Mark Bui. We mentioned his name multiple times, so <laughs> I will talk to him next time. But he has been doing some very interesting calculation and there is one uh, in Brazil uh, on, in October with Horus. There is another very interesting one in the US, Eribates, another target of the um, Lucy mission. It's gonna be in August too, in October, sorry. In October, yeah, yeah, we've got a few events coming up in October and a number of them are really important. Uh, Eurobates, that the, the one you just mentioned is our first target. And um, I'd really like to get uh, a number of cords across that object. And then uh, preliminary, we also have an occultation that goes across Spain. I believe it's on October 1st. Yep. And that's our smallest target. And so really understanding the size of it um, and making sure that we understand uh, how big it is uh, because we have some estimates, but there's some uncertainty on it. And I'd really like to shrink that uncertainty would be super important. And so I'm hoping that we get a good number of people observing uh, the preliminary occultation as well as Eurobates and Aura. So there's lots of good events coming up. All right. So team, that's, and uh, Rachel, that's a good excuse for you to travel to Spain in October. <laughs> We see you there. <laughs> what do you think? Oh yeah. Look, I'm yeah, just no, looking. No it's going through Valencia. Yeah, it oh. probably won't be cold, so you won't be cold. It's just a long trip. Well, it's just a long trip. What yeah. about the one? What about the other one that's going? Isn't the one you said was transiting uh, the United States as well? There yes. is. Yeah. Where, where, what cities? Will that? Will we? San Francisco. San Francisco. Oh, you get the one instead of us. Is that right? Um, come on, you can take an airplane and fly all the way. <laughs> it's not that much. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, I see you in October for the San Francisco uh, occultation or in Spain? What's your choice? <laughs> Both. Both? All okay, right, good. <laughs> I, I'm very glad we're creating a community of very motivated observers. That's what we wanted. That's what I hope we to want. see you in person very soon at a conference, Kathy. But team, that would be great. Yeah. Person be as great. Well. Yes, that would be great. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time for this talk for this contribution to these observations as well thank you Bye. and i remind our viewers that city institutes is a non-profit organization so if you incline you can make a donation by following the link shown at the bottom here but you can also simply follow us on social media we are on twitter on youtube on everything just click on the video here to make to get notification when when we have a new uh, city life we have this city life every week and we talk about a lot of things, not only occultation. Sometimes we talk about aliens because we are the city institute. Thank you very much again, Katie, Tim, Rachel. <laughs>